All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, first um, uh, distinguished lecture organized uh, by the Polio Academy for Interdisciplinary Research pair in the fall semester. Um, for those who just joined me, I just wanted to uh, spend one minute to introduce uh, uh, the Academy. Uh, we call PEAR, uh, which consists of uh, 11 research institutes and five research centers. And currently we have over 400 researchers in those um, uh, institutes and the centers conducting research in the areas of uh, advanced technology, uh, cities, and then uh, health and well-being. So today we are very uh, lucky uh, to invite Professor Michael Betty uh, from University uh, College of London to give us the lecture. Now I'd like to just uh, to uh, introduce him to you. He has a very glorious uh, CV and it's very long. I just try to be brief, but it still will take me a couple of minutes. So um, Professor Betty is a uh, distinguished speaker today, and he uh, is a leading uh, urban planner, uh, is a leading urban planner, uh, geographer, and uh, spatial data scientist from the United Kingdom. He is known for his bottom-up approach and the integration of mathematics and the computing in understanding the city as a system. His mathematical analysis that it makes uh, data virtually representable are highly influential, helping us to understand the trend in cities and uh, region better, informing our way forward towards uh, future cities. Professor Betty is a uh, Bartlett Professor of Planning at the University College in London, where he is a chair of the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis. He founded the center in year 1995 with a dedication to developing a science of cities focused on digital method for developing plans for sustainable and equitable cities. So Michael is also a fellow of uh, the uh, Alan Turing Institute, a British national institute for data science and uh, artificial intelligence. Michael started his academic career in 1970s as a lecturer, then the reader in the geography at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. Prior to his current position at the UCL, he held academic leadership positions at the American universities and the other British universities. He was the head of the department and the dean of architecture and training at the University of Wales Institute of Science and Technology the predecessor uh, of Cardiff University in the 1980s. I just talked to him, I realized we stay in the same institution, but maybe 20 years apart. Then he also served as the director of the National Center for Geographical Information and Analysis at the State University of New York at the Buffalo. So Michael has been uh, contributing to urban design and planning as well as relative, uh, related technology development with his influential publications, extensive research work and, uh, uh, and global network engagement. For example, his most recent book is uh, Inventing Future Cities and uh, other two books like uh, Cities and Complexity and the new science of cities were awarded the Aloso Prize of the Regional Science Association. He is the managing editor of the journal Environment and Planning B, Planning and Design, and the co-editor of the book Urban Informatics, which is the first open access book that is systematically introduced the principle of the urban informatics. So Michael's research excellence has been recognized by many awards, as well as the fellowship at the Academy of at the national and international levels. Among the many honors, he received the Valdin Laude Prize, which is commonly known as the Nobel for the Geography in 2003. The commander of the Order of the British Empire in the Queen's Birthday Honors in 2004. 
And most recently, the Outstanding Achiever Award of the Modeling Geographical Systems Commission from the International Geographical Union in 2022. So Michael is a fellow of the British Academy, the Academy of the Social Sciences, and the Loyal Society. So it's a uh, list that can go on and on. So I think we should I should stop here. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Professor Michael Bedding. So Michael, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. Um, uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, I just need to do a little bit of housekeeping to share my screen, uh, and then we'll begin. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, move a little bit of this cluster out of the way and um, put it into presentation mode. Okay, there we go. Um, Okay, thank you for Pre Professor Chen for uh, that very nice introduction. Um, uh, as you said, um, we did inhabit the more or less the same uh, location in the University of Cardiff, uh, in in the former guise of the Institute of uh, Wales uh, Institute of Science and Technology, uh, where I was professor of planning in the nineteen eighties, uh, and you were um, a professor in uh, in in the School of Architecture. Uh, almost in the same building, I think. So we walked in each other's footsteps in this particular context. Anyway, uh, without more ado, let me uh, tell you what I'm going to, uh, to do this afternoon. Um, it's called a Developing a Science of Cities. Now, I'm going to actually uh, talk about a number of different things. But if you'd like to see the talk, um, uh, either now or after, you can download it from uh, these uh, these links, basically, the link to my blog at the top, and then a tiny URL, a shortened version of the link at the bottom. I'll give you these again, um, it, but if you do want to actually look at this on your phone or whatever, or laptop, uh, then you can actually sort of, well, take a photograph of that and then and type it in, basically. But I will give it again uh, at the end. Okay, let me tell you what I want to do in terms of the lecture. Um, I'm really going to talk about a new view of cities in that sense. So I'll begin by talking a little bit about what is a city, and I'll make the point that there's been a sea change in how we think about cities over the last 50 years. None of this is very surprising because uh, the last 50 years has really related to the development of computing. Uh, our sciences have elaborated themselves in many different ways. Uh, and there's the pair, for example, the actual um, partnership in interdisciplinarity that you're introducing here is a, a very good example of how these ideas from different fields are coming together. And I'll be sort of relating them to the development of cities. I'll talk a little bit about science and computing, and then I'll move on to uh, the dominant approach in terms of science in the mid 20th century, which was called the systems approach. Now, the systems approach, uh, which tended to think about cities or any kind of system from the top down, uh, gradually evolved into the complexity theory approach. Uh, and over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, complexity theory has grown up. And this is a, a, a theory about how systems develop really from the bottom up. So the contrast is between top down and bottom up. And there are some fairly major issues concerned with this kind of dichotomy uh, in the sense that planning as we know it tends to be top down but the way cities largely develop is bottom up and so there are there, there are certain conundrums and paradoxes involved in are wanting to make the cities better through planning from the top down uh, that'll lead me on to talk a little bit about the emergence and evolution of cities uh, and I'll particularly emphasize the idea of geometry, the idea of form following function, because a good deal of our thinking about cities can be seen in terms of their morphology, their form in this particular context. And many of the ideas about emergence and evolution can be seen in those days, in those ways. Um, uh, that leads us on really to talk about networks, flows and linkages are all important in that context. And then I'll begin to wrap it up by talking about building models of cities, which contain all of the bits and pieces that I'll, I'll have assembled so far in this context. 
Of course, that takes us into a, a, another domain, really, the idea of building models and cities. And that really simply points the direction of where we can go from here in that sense. OK, so let me begin then in terms of what is a city. Now, um, 150 years ago, uh, I think, uh, society at large began to think seriously about cities. It wasn't that people didn't think about them seriously before, but they thought about them uh, in a more explicit and obvious way in that sense. And this was largely due to the Industrial Revolution, because cities basically uh, were dirty, uh, uh, smoke-filled affairs, basically highly congested and so on. And uh, really, this led to uh, the notion of thinking about how to plan them and build a better quality of life to um, uh, to re realize many of the sustainable development goals, which, of course, have been coined a lot later. So prior to about 150 years ago, people thought of cities as in, in, in two very different senses or many different senses, really in one sense as works of art all the way to cities being the devil incarnate, basically, that uh, the, the Victorian view of the cities was really the cities were evil things and we should return to the countryside. And those sorts of ideas are, are still writ large to some extent uh, in terms of our thinking about cities. So lots of different ways. Now, what really began as attempts to in, in, improve the quality of life was based on public health measure, measures and philanthropy. And much of our present planning system, even your planning system here in Hong Kong, uh, has uh, is embryonic in terms of um, some of the ideas that really relate back back to the Industrial Revolution and the idea of public health. And cities, of course, were treated largely as physical systems to be improved by better physical infrastructure. That's still the same today. But the notion of dealing with them as social systems was really on the back burner. Only more recently, in the last 100 years or so, have begun to think about cities as social systems, perhaps even in the last 50 years in that sense. Now, of course, the Industrial Revolution led to modernity in that sense, and uh, the great prophets of modernity in architecture, such as Le Corbusier, Corbusier said that um, uh, a city or a, a building, basically, was a machine for living in this sense, and this really was the modern, modern movement. And it articulated cities purely in terms of physical form. The other kind of iconic phrase is the idea of form follows function, that uh, that the, the, the form of the city actually displays the function. And that's embodied in the principles of modern architecture, the fact that we see clean lines, basically, and the structure of the uh, of the building basically illustrates itself in terms of its form in that sense. That was really the dominant paradigm that really came out of the 19th century and certainly dominated uh, architecture until the mid 20th century, if not be longer, if not uh, still today. Now, throughout the, the 19th century, there were slow glimmers of a more considered science of cities emerging. Patrick Geddes, for example, the so-called father of town planning in Britain, in terms he brought biology into the frame. He was trained as a biologist um, uh, under Huxley at uh, what was then Imperial College in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the nineteenth century. Um, uh, and of course, the German location theorists from von Thoyman onwards, a little bit earlier, they brought to bear ideas about how you could locate activities in the most economically uh, appropriate place in this context. So a theory of cities based on, uh, on, on locations and economies basically grew up. So these were really straws in the wind. And by the 1920s, there was a feeling that in the social world, uh, that uh, the social world could be seen in a much more systematic, positivist way. That cities, for example, could be seen as in analogy to physical systems. There'd been great success in the development of physics through the 19th and uh, uh, the 20th century uh, in this context. And it was felt that uh, the success in those sorts of scientific fields could be transferred to the, the social sciences, to social systems, and certainly uh, 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 building systems such as cities in that context. Now, out of all this came the idea that um, uh, that, uh, that, that that cities could be controlled in some sense in the same way as we might control a mechanical system in the, in the way that, for example, we might regulate the city in much the same way as a thermostat controls, curls a boiler, basically, in that sense. And that really became sort of 
to some extent, a significant, if not the dominant paradigm uh, during the middle of the 20th century. And this really led directly to what is referred to as the systems approach, the idea that we can understand, predict and design cities uh, in a kind of systematic way, really, to some extent, from the top down. And this was illustrated in lots of different uh, developments uh, in engineering and so on, in cybernetics and so on, which really dominated, you know, the, the mid 20th century onwards in that sense. Now, there are two parallel things in this, a slight digression, really, that, that clearly science itself uh, was important in, in thinking about how to introduce more systematic thinking into how we thought about cities. In C.P. Snow's term, he wrote the uh, the book on the two cultures, basically. He contrasted arts and humanities with the sciences. And in some senses, what had emerged in the mid 20th century was the idea that cities could be seen as a kind of science, basically. The science we'll be talking about this afternoon is really um, related to social physics. I'll explain that a bit later, location theory, transportation and urban economics in that sense. But this is only one science. There are many sciences that, uh, although the title of this is Developing a Science of Cities, um, my own view about all of this, that there are many sciences, basically. I'll be talking about one kind of science in that sense. But, for example, there is uh, uh, building science um, in, in that sense, which uh, Professor Chen, I think, is probably uh, related to in terms of his particular expertise. But there's uh, related to energy and so on, ecology, economics, environment, climate, demography, the grand challenges that were talked about um, in terms of the the film that we actually uh, saw introducing the 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 the, the, per, the the per initiative in this sense uh, really in a sense relates to those grand challenges relate to many different views about cities as a kind of scientific systems in that sense and i suppose by science here what i mean is that science is basically knowledge that can be culled and developed using the scientific method and the scientific method of course yields plausible and testable theories and it yields predictions which in some sense are useful to cities now of course what we've discovered over the last 50 years, and we're continuing to, to, to discover it in more detail, uh, is that in, in largely in some sense, our predictions are always wrong. We can't, um, in, we can't uh, the future is not magic in this particular context. Our uh, science is not magic. Uh, and in George Box's hallowed phrase that he said that all models are wrong, but some are useful in a sense. We could uh, uh, generalize that to all theories are wrong, but some are useful in that particular context. So that's really the background uh, to these developments. The other point, the other, the other straw in the wind here is computing. Computers emerge to some extent uh, just as, as uh, our views of cities were beginning to change in a way. And it's no accident that the development of computing over the last 50, 60, 70 years um, has coincided. It's paralleled the development of uh, new ways of thinking about cities. And I should say at this point that we're not just talking about cities per se. We're talking about economies. We're talking about uh, society generally, and many aspects of them with that really relate to the, the this new science, this new thinking in terms of systematic uh, ideas. Um, of course, computers came out of the Second World War, and the philosophy of computers, uh, particularly associated with Alan Turing and John von Neumann, they really defined uh, the computer as the universal machine. And it's taken us the last 75 years to figure out what that really means, that at every twist and turn in the computer revolution, it's been demonstrated that computing can be uh, developed to do things that we never expected. So, for example, graphics, for example, back in the, uh, the beginnings of computing was never thought about. Uh, in this particular term, the, the idea, for example, that um, uh, the computer could actually be embedded in some sense into, into the fabric of the environment, the idea of smart cities was really sort of way off the map right at the beginning in that sense. So computers, in a sense, have, have, have driven the momentum in terms of the development of these sorts of sciences in that sense. OK, so let me talk very quickly about the systems approach that uh, none of this is particularly profound in a sense, but essentially we can think of, uh, of systems such as cities in a sense uh, as being systems that are ordered really from the top down, basically. 
any ordered collections of ideas, objects, and so on, uh, which have interactions between them, can be defined as a, as, as a system. And of course, cities were sufficiently uh, complex in everybody's perception to embrace this kind of logic. And it led directly to the idea that we could think of uh, not only cities as being uh, organized from the top down into uh, cities, subsystems, and so on, systems, subsystems, et cetera, in a kind of hierarchical fashion, but could also be controlled from the top down uh, in this particular context. Um, and the systems approach which really developed was really found in its clearest expression in areas where theory and practice was somewhat disorganized, really. The, uh, the development of uh, physics and chemistry, many of the mainstream sciences, did not really require a systems approach because the systems were there already in some sense. It was in areas such as psychology, um, uh, management and so on, in terms of cities and so on, that the systems approach really took off in that sense. Now, one of the kind of key issues in all of this, that the systems uh, that were looked at looked as though they were in equilibrium. Cities, in fact, uh, look as though at the first sight, as though they're actually rather stable in a sense. Uh, of course, we've come to uh, expect exactly the opposite once we begin to dig into cities in this particular context. So the origins of complexity theory was to was to change the idea of thinking of cities from the from the top down to thinking of them as the bottom up. Nothing could be further from the reality of the fact that uh, cities were not uh, equilibrium in some sense. So what we get is uh, what we get is. Um, uh, what we see now this was this was really no longer the sense if we look at a city uh, we see that it's never in equilibrium it's constantly changing it's dominated not by negative feedback the idea of the thermostat and the boiler uh, basically is the wrong one in some sense it's dominated by positive feedback in the sense that cities are crucibles for innovation only recently begun to think that uh, that many of the, the more profound developments in society in terms of our inventions and so on really have to take place in cities because we need lots of people around us to actually produce the the essence of, uh, of, of new ideas in that sense. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and so the behavior of cities is can be quite surprising and even unpredictable in that sense. It's much more volatile uh, than the, their appearance suggests in a sense. Now, this movement has gathered place, uh, has gathered pace informally. Um, it's uh, represented in lots of ideas about how systems are controlled, such as the economy. Uh, and it's central in, in some sense, the idea of, um, uh, of the bottom up kind of uh, development or evolution in that sense uh, of things like computer science, even in that sense. So the emergence and evolution of cities has really taken over to some extent, and the notion of smooth change has been quickly abandoned. Uh, ideas concerning catastrophe theory, bifurcation, and chaos, these have all come onto the agenda. And the notion of positive feedback is essential to these dynamics in that sense. Indeed, the, uh, the typhoon that uh, we're sort of experiencing, or the beginning of the typhoon, I guess, uh, outside really is an exact an excellent example if you like of um something far from equilibrium in some sense something that is unexpected that emerges from the bottom up basically uh, and is really uh, dominated by ideas about uh, positive feedback. Now, many of these ideas have been developed uh, were developed uh, in, in the uh, in the in the beginning or in the middle of the 20th, 20th century and a little bit later, basically in places like the Santa Fe Institute, in a sense, where evolution, uh, uh, bottom up thinking, was really sort of uh, dominating rather than thinking about cities from the top down in that sense. OK, so there are lots of issues uh, that really define complexity theory in this sense that order and pattern emerge, for example, from uh, bottom up type thinking, growth and change are, are organized in that sense. The idea of emergence, basically, is really kind of central in this. There's no overall control. There's limits on predictability. Uh, really, where we start actually matters. The idea that history matters the idea that we have what's called path dependence, that uh, where we've been in the past it dictates to some extent where we will be now and where we are in the future. These are the kind of ideas in, 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 in um, uh, complexity theory. This does, these do not replace the idea in systems theory, but they add to it. The idea of 
hierarchy, interaction, subsystems, and so on, are still important, and these are systems ideas, but the, if you like, they're, they're, they're now being developed in terms of the kind of dynamics and change and so on associated with complexity theory. So really to summarize this, the, the, the switch over the last uh, 50 or more years from the, well, from the middle of the uh, uh, 20th century to now, basically, uh, this switch from systems to complexity is really a switch about thinking about systems as being more like the cities as being more like machines, basically, to ones with to cities being more like biologies in a sense, but the, the idea of the machine analogy versus the organic analogy in this particular context. Uh, and lots of these ideas um, were anticipated. Uh, and I just want to point to four different uh, sources, basically, which really talked about complexity theory, the idea of switching our thinking from bottom up, from top down to bottom up, basically, uh, in the in the middle of the 20th century. So these were really straws in the wind. The, the, the great book, which in some senses symbolizes it all, and it's reasonably readable, is The Death and Life of Great American Cities. You can see a picture of um, a penguin copy or a pelican copy of that book from uh, uh, the 1960s. Um, uh, indeed, it was the book that uh, that I had a copy of it um, uh, back then, basically, uh, because we were all as uh, town planning students uh, exhorted to read it, basically. And in it, Jane Jacobs sort of said that we really ought to think about cities as highly diverse, you know, chaotic, unordered places, but with pattern and order within them, so basically a great melting pot of things, rather than the kind of top down machine analogy, uh, which came out of the move, the modern movement. Uh, a couple of other papers, Science and Complexity by Warren Weaver. He was the um, uh, the director, I think, of the um, of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, just after the war. There's a very uh, prescient paper by him where he talks about science and complexity in different views. And then, of course, the paper by, um, uh, by Herbert Simon. Uh, Simon, of course, was the Nobel Prize winner, both in uh, in economics, basically, in the in the in the in the eighties, basically, but was also uh, very instrumental in early AI in that sense. The architecture of, architecture of complexity, etc. Uh, and last but not least, Christopher Alexander, uh, the architect, basically, who wrote uh, wrote several papers about uh, systems and uh, architecture, and his famous paper, "The City Is Not a Tree." I'll point out um, in a moment that uh, some of the ideas about emergence and growth in cities. Uh, look at them as trees. What Alexander is saying, in fact, is that the tree is too simple a structure. Uh, that it's a much more complex structure, which is a forest, if you like, in some sense. Uh, and these, of course, are abstract ideas about the way systems are organized in that sense. And then my own book, uh, which uh, Professor Chen referred to, Cities and Complexity, pulls uh, some of this sort of stuff together, basically, uh, and talks about how we can build models of these things based on complexity theory. OK, so uh, let me talk about form follows function, talk about fractals, talk about uh, uh, geometry and so on. Now, this is this is a very long preamble. I do realize that. And um, uh, it's not very visual in some senses, but uh, I will maybe begin to make it visual now, this talk, in a sense, because many of the ideas in terms of complexity, the idea of uh, thinking about cities at the bottom up, are really based on this notion that we can actually see some of these ideas in the cities themselves, basically. So let me begin with um, uh, with a picture. Now, this, of course, is um, uh, this, of course, is a picture of London. Basically, it's a picture in 1990 of uh, the density of population. There's only two states of density, uh, red and yellow, in this particular context. But what it illustrates is the fact that nobody planned it. This is not this is not something that is developed from the top down. It's clearly developed from the bottom up. And you can actually almost see the growth inherent in this particular structure. You can make out one or two physical features, basically, such as the Lee, uh, the River Lee going uh, uh, north in that, that strip, basically. Uh, if you know London, you can just about trace out the Thames, basically. But one of the features of this, of, of this particular picture uh, is that it illustrates the idea of of, of the fact that the, the form of the city is the same at different levels. In other words, if we break off a little bit of the city here, we take one of the one of these bits basically, and we measure the 
um, the regularity or the irregularity and so on, or the structure basically of it, we can find that that little bit of city basically has the same sort of structure as a big bit of city. So at every hierarchical level down, we can see there's a degree of similarity in the way things take place. We can also see in a sense how individual cities begin to merge because many of these bits and pieces out in the suburbs basically are individual towns in their own right. It's often said that London is a is a city of villages, basically, and you can actually see that if you go north from the centre, uh, you hit Hampstead, which, of course, was uh, dis uh, distinctly different from uh, Britain in uh, even in Victorian times, basically, uh, on the edge in that sense, and so on and so forth, basically. So that's really our starting point in terms of thinking about this kind of complexity, basically. If I scale it up, and we look at the southeast of England, you can just see London there basically in the southeast again. Uh, and you can also make out in the top uh, left hand corner, um, Birmingham in a sense, and then Bristol and so on. Uh, you can see that uh, in some senses, we've got cities of different forms, different shapes on all scales. And that's important because scaling, the idea of scale and the idea of repetition across scales, the idea of similarity across scales is pretty central to uh, the way we're talking about the growth of cities in this particular context. I'll come on to this uh, in a later because we, a little bit later because if we if we look at the shape and the size of those cities at different scales, then we find that there tend to be one large city and then um, uh, two or three uh, cities at the next level and then, five or six cities at the next level and so on. So you see a regular progression with more and more of the bits of cities being smaller and smaller. And of course, none of that's very surprising because to be a big city, you've got to be a small city first in that sense. Uh, so there's a growth process involved in that. Let me scale up again, scale up to, to Britain itself, and you can see that. And then on the, on the right there, we have night lights, uh, which are showing um, a population. Uh, distribution to some extent in uh, in Western Europe. Uh, and um, I'm not going to show any, I don't have a picture of that, but uh, we could scale up even further. I mean, if we look at the world distribution of population uh, in this particular context using night lights in a sense. So let's look at a, a couple of places which are more familiar, basically. So this on the left is uh, the Greater Bay Area. And on the right, we've got Shanghai. This is taken from the human, uh, uh, the global uh, uh, settlement data, which uh, the JRC in Europe and um, uh, a season in uh, uh, Columbia University actually put together. Um, so it's a, a very detailed database of uh, population densities. Let me actually um, impress this idea of the complexity of things by actually zooming in on the, on the Greater Bay Area. Um, and this is a remarkable picture in many senses because it shows the complexity of of how these cities are fusing together. It shows it it contains all of the kind of features that relate to complexity theory in this co context. The idea of self similarity, uh, the idea that the little bits have a similar structure to the big bits in that sense, that there is a hierarchy in a sense. And it always I always find it remarkable to be sitting here in Hong Kong. Uh, which is an incredibly sort of diverse and uh, um, uh, di diverse and complex place. Uh, and it's only one bit of this overall complexity. Um, it's interesting to ask people how many uh, how many people live in this region, basically. And I've uh, even on this trip here, I've uh, I've 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 heard estimates from 40 million uh, all the way to about 80 million. Basically, I think the true uh, estimate, which if you if you do you use a pencil and just draw around those and uh, and count count the the most dense parts basically, uh, then uh, which are connected in a sense, then you'd probably be talking about sixty million or something of that sort. Uh, but again, this is showing you the kind of complexity of things. Now, of course, in some senses, this science of cities that I'm talking about is really based on. Uh, explaining uh, and, uh, well, certainly observing uh, and understanding and explaining all of these bits and how they really relate together. Here's London, by the way, basically, and I think this is about the same scale. It's always a bit tricky when you go to the web um, and uh, pull these off and then uh, scale them, basically. But this is about the same scale. And you can see that in many senses, 
um, the complexity of this picture is really quite different from the complexity of the Greater Bay Area in some senses. Uh, I won't elaborate those differences, you can see them for yourselves, but London is a little bit more compact. It's simpler in some sense, largely I think, because you haven't got sort of big metropolitan areas such as Hong Kong, Shenzhen and uh, Guangzhou basically in a sense, uh, which make it much more complex in a sense and perhaps even uh, even more than more than that. And again, this is a characteristic. I think this picture of what I showed you earlier on, uh, in terms of the population density of uh, of London itself, basically. Now, there's, you can see in this hierarchy, and you can see scale. It's an excellent example. These are excellent examples of scaling. Now, of course, scaling, in a sense, uh, we've been looking at uh, the location of things. But if we look at network structures, then we see the same kind of scaling taking place. One of the kind of key ideas in all of this is the notion that cities... Um, uh, and complex systems really grow and evolve to fill the space that they exist within. They reach out into the into the space, and the networks represent the way energy is sort of uh, uh, produced and disseminated in terms of these systems. Now, here's a couple of pictures of uh, of networks in our cells. Um, I can't do it here, but basically. Uh, in in if I get if I give a lecture on fractals to our own students, basically a, a, a real lecture, basically, then I often bring a torch in and shine it through my hand to actually sort of see the vein structure, basically, in that sense, uh, illustrating the idea that networks are there to actually service to some extent to move energy around within the system in this particular context. OK, here's some excellent examples, very simple ones in terms of biological systems that are fractal, uh, are self-similar, a little bit like our cities, but this is clearer. In a sense, you can see the energy being distributed in this leaf in that context. Uh, in, in a way, you can see uh, indeed um, uh, how, for example, the leaf is reaching out into the air to actually capture uh, energy in that sense. Um, and uh, here, for example, are some pictures of uh, of different kinds of networks, basically, rather than locations in 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 which do match very closely uh, the previous examples. On the immediate left, there we've got a picture of uh, of retailing, shopping, basically in London, and you can see the you can see Hyde Park right in the middle there on the left hand side, uh, the open park. Uh, and the big city centre, the enormous city centre that uh, exists in London, basically. And then you can also see the retailing reaching out into the suburbs in this sense. All of these networks uh, show how uh, the city is growing by reaching out, in a sense. Uh, and it's arguable that, the, uh, that, that this is perhaps the best model of how a city should develop in terms of, in, in that sense. There are some very obvious things of minimizing the amount of energy, basically, uh, in terms of uh, parsimonious networks like this. Uh, and uh, all I should mention on this one, they're, they're all pictures of London. The one in the middle is uh, the town of Wolverhampton in the West Midlands of uh, Britain. And uh, the, one of the interesting examples is that you have a naturally growing network, basically, and then uh, a top-down uh, imposition of a ring road. It's one of the few towns in Britain that has a perfect ring road. That's about one kilometer square, that ring road, to give you an idea of scale. So these are all the different scales, but the different scales, in fact, uh, reveal, of course, that we have self-similarity between scales. The top uh, right-hand corner are night lights, um, uh, night lights picture in, in, in Tokyo, basically, in a sense. That's a particularly good one where you can see the uh, the density and you can also look at the uh, way the, the city is spreading out into its suburbs. Now, I could talk for hours about all these sorts of patterns, but let me just say that that all of this is related to what is referred to as fractal geometry. Um, first developed probably 50 years or more ago, of course, all of these ideas go back perhaps indefinitely into uh, 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 to before the Industrial Revolution, perhaps to the Greeks even in a sense. But nevertheless, Benoit Mandelbrot um, uh, has developed many of these ideas and they're uh, best seen in his wonderful book, The Fractal Geometry of Nature, uh, which was, was actually produced first in France in 77 and then translated uh, uh, into English in 1982. Uh, and what he basically said was that um, all of these objects that we've been looking at, basically, in a sense, 
um, are more complex than you think of. They're, they're fractals, basically. Uh, and the key issue in terms of fractal objects is that their scale, um, uh, or rather their form, I should say, uh, is, is that uh, uh, they are fractional dimensions. And I'll come on to that in, in a moment, but uh, uh, some quite profound issues that really come out of this with respect to the way we think about geometry. Okay, very quickly in terms of what fractals are, uh, and I'll show you some more pictures in a moment uh, of this, uh, then essentially fractals um, exist between space in some sense. Uh, they're self-similar, self-similar is a, a fractal object is, uh, uh, and uh, essentially the fractal fills space. And we've seen examples of that in the way the cities fill space, the way leaves fill space and so on. But if we actually think of... Um, uh, the geometry of Euclid that we learn at school, basically, they think of zero dimension as a point, uh, one dimension as a line, two dimensions as a plane, three D as a volume, and so on, uh, into the uh, higher order dimensions in that sense. What fractals are, they're objects that exist between dimensions in this sense. Ironically, if you take the fractal view, uh, most of Euclidean geometry is extreme and fractal is the norm in this particular context. Now, an excellent example of a fractal that, uh, that uh, fills space uh, is a piece of paper. Every, we'd all probably agree that the, the piece of paper that you can see with the hand on in that context is uh, you know, two dimensional in some sense. Turn it into something more than two dimensions, but not quite three, just by crumbling it. Now, I can't do this. Uh, well, I probably could do it, actually, in, in Zoom, basically. I switch the uh, PowerPoint and you could see me again. But um, uh, we take it for granted that, in other words, we've taken a two dimensional thing and it's still two dimensional. Um, it's still two dimensional, but it's more than two dimensions to describe it. You'd really have to think in terms of three dimensions, but it's not three dimensions in the Euclidean sense in that way. So this is an excellent example with a, a, a fractal dimension of something between two and three. Uh, a good example of um, a, a fractal dimension between one and two is if we put the, the pen on, on the paper here uh, and we then um, uh, began to draw a continuous line, we could actually draw a continuous line and fill in this picture with the continuous line uh, fill it all in. It would look two-dimensional, but it would still be a line, basically, which is one-dimensional. And that really is uh, the idea of fractal geometry in some sense. Now, some excellent examples of fractals are tree structures, for example. We've seen a couple of these before. These are all, apart from the one in the uh, the the, uh, the, ne the maple leaf, basically, in the middle there, uh, these are all kind of computer graphics. And a lot of early computer graphics was... Uh, exploiting the ideas of fractals in the 1980s and 1990s, basically. Uh, a good deal of uh, uh, computer graphics in the movie industry, in fact, uh, basically simulated landscapes using um, using fractal ideas, etc. And back then to um, city morphologies, basically, we can then begin to look at the hierarchies, we can begin to look at the dimension of these things, uh, because the dimensions of them that, that show you that all the space is not filled in these two dimensions, uh, but um, uh, enough of space is, is filled to show that the uh, the dimension between uh, one and two, basically, in a sense, or between two and three, basically, certainly between one and two in terms of these pictures, uh, is these cities, uh, these city shapes tend to be something in the order of about a fractional the dimension of 1.7. Now, I'm not going to tell you in any sense how you can actually measure these fractal dimensions. That's a, a, to some extent a detail uh, in terms of what I'm talking about today. Um, but nevertheless, we can actually measure these things. And there is indeed uh, 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 several branches of uh, uh, fractal geometry where uh, there are different ways of thinking about these dimensions, etc., and it gets into sort of fairly hairy mathematics, basically. One of the features, too, in all of this, which is important in terms of scale, is that when we look at the objects uh, in, in these particular pictures, if we look at, for example, Britain, you can see the big towns and you can see the small towns. If we were to arrange the objects in terms of size, we'd find a small number of big objects and a very large number of little objects. And as I said before, that's largely because to be a big town, you've got to be a little town first, basically, in that sense. Uh, and so you have growth and evolution in that particular context. But the relationship between the objects, 
um, is actually very regular. And, and much of fractal geometry is, is, is looking at this degree of regularity. I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, and also uh, this particular pic this, this picture that, uh, that uh, I've just moved, I'm about to move on from, uh, basically gives you an idea about how we might even build uh, models of how these morphologies take place in a sense. So here, for example, is a, a little diagram showing you the uh, how we can zoom in and we can see the fractal structure emerging itself uh, in this particular way. Uh, and what we have here is um, uh, here is uh, uh, the growth, if you like, of a fractal cluster planted into some kind of landscape. Now, the landscape, in fact, uh, on the on the on the top right and the um, uh, the little bit on the lower left, basically, um, this will please please Professor Shen because this actually is Cardiff. Uh, and that's the um, the River Avon, basically. Uh, and uh, what we've done in this particular context is to plant uh, a fractal and grow the fractal, basically. And there's a good deal of physics, which is literally related to physical objects, which are grown in this particular manner. But here we're growing the town in this particular manner and we're tuning it. We can, we can parameterize it. Now, I'm not going to go into that, basically, but... Um, uh, a number of uh, uh, tools and techniques in cellular automata basically uh, are really related to some of these ideas. So we can actually grow the structures in this particular and tune them to different shapes, basically, tune them to different containers in which they are. And some simple, very simple models of how cities grow from either linear cities through to radially concentric compact cities, basically, can be simulated using these ideas from fractals. Uh, we wrote a book on this, Paul Longley and myself, when we were at Cardiff in the 1980s. Uh, well, the book came out in the early 90s, basically. Um, uh, and uh, you can see a lot of these sort of ideas in that particular context. Now, going back a little bit further, um, if you go into human geography, then you can find a lot of thinking about retail hierarchies, the idea of hierarchies of retail centres, shopping centres, and so on. And this really relates, this is a picture from Cristala's book, uh, so-called central places, meaning uh, central points of retailing in uh, in southern Germany, published in 1933. Now, of course, I made this point about the fact that um, if we count the number of big centres versus little centres, then we get uh, some kind of rank ordering, uh, which is highly regular. Uh, and this is referred to um, as Zipp's law, basically, I'll come back to this in a moment, basically. But if you actually take the United States, as Zipp, in fact, did in 1949, uh, and take the big cities versus the little cities, um, and so this is the population of, of, of all the cities in the United States at different points in time from uh, 1790, which was the first U.S. census, uh, through to 1933, I think, or sorry, due to 1930, uh, when Zip concluded his analysis, what you actually find is that if you plot it on a log-log scale, you get a straight line. So unerringly, this is uh, the the these straight lines appear, and these are, this is referred to as the rank size rule. There is a precise formula for it, uh, which is that um, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, the population. Uh, and the rank, basically, and you plot it on a log-log scale like this, you get a straight line, which, in fact, is a power law. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but there are lots of power laws that uh, uh, pertain to ideas in fractals in this particular context, because the power law um, is the only mathematical equation which actually scales, basically, in a sense, it scales directly. Again, that's a feature of the fractal geometry. OK, there's lots of basic uh, conundrums and paradoxes uh, um, uh, in the sense that one of the kind of features about uh, a fractal is that um, certain basic properties such as fixed length, etc., uh, disappear. That, in other words, the length of a fractal can often be intricate. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that in a moment. Uh, Mandelbrot himself, the inventor of fractals, basically wrote a, a famous paper in science in 1967 called How Long is the Coastline of Britain? Of course, the answer is that the coastline of Britain is, is infinite because there are more and more detail you pick up as you begin to uh, change your measuring scale, basically, uh, and move down onto the coastline itself. In fact, the coastline is 
unclear, it's uncertain, it's, it's difficult to define. So the answer, of course, is that um, uh, it's not a meaningful question in this particular context, how long is the coastline of Britain? Let me actually show you um, uh, an example of this, basically. So this is constructed. I know this is going to make you dizzy a bit, it's making me dizzy at the moment, uh, but you can actually see how we're zooming in and you have the same degree of irregularity. This is a classic example of a fractal. So if we think of our cities in these terms, uh, then there are lots of these ideas that we might really uh, develop, um, which can, can show us, you know, uh, how complex the system is in some senses. Okay, let me stop that basically and move on. How do we construct one of these fractals basically? Now, here's, a, here's an example very quickly about how it demonstrates the idea that the coastline is infinite in a sense, the length. We start off with a little triangle in the, in the left-hand box and we then scale the triangle, uh, uh, take a third of it, uh, a third of the uh, of A basically, and we stick the little bit, the little triangle on the edge basically. So you can see if we move from the uh, from the triangle to the uh, the Star of David uh, in that context, uh, then we have stuck a little bit on each of that, and you can see immediately that the the length of the of the line, the perimeter basically, uh, is is greater basically in that sense. It's gone up. If, if we keep on doing that then the perimeter gets bigger and bigger and bigger. There's no ending. We go beneath the scale of the of, of resolution of the screen or the scale of resolution of uh, well, however we're actually uh, drawing that, basically. But ultimately, this is a demonstration that the perimeter uh, or the length of the coastline, if you like, in a sense, is, is effectively infinite or not defined, probably, but infinite in that sense. Of course, the area is defined, basically. The area is conserved in that sense. So that's a real paradox to some extent, a very simple paradox. And you can see on the, um, on, on, on the right, we show the construction uh, on the right of that picture. And then um, the third example, uh, the third uh, illustration on the, on the right is, um, is the hierarchy in that sense. Uh, so all of these things are really key to the idea of the structure and the system and so on. Christopher Alexander, I mentioned, uh, wrote a paper called A City is Not a Tree. What he effectively said is that, that complex systems, uh, almost the fractal idea is too simple in some sense. That uh, uh, And here he shows a picture of Chandigarh, which is a new town in um, uh, in India, is it India or Pakistan. It's, it's in, probably on the border, basically. Uh, Chandigarh, which was planned by uh, Le Corbusier, I think, a very simple kind of structure, basically, in a sense. But actually, he he then goes on to uh, show a picture of the sort of relationship between uh, different units, basically, in Manhattan, basically. So you can see the subsystems defining Chandigarh are much simpler than those in Manhattan. Of course, what Jane Jacobs was talking about in her book uh, was that the world should be like Manhattan. It should not be like Shandigar. Shandigar is too simple uh, in that sense. To, uh, and of course, ultimately, um, uh, uh, that uh, people in cities will uh, vote with their feet, basically, in a sense. And uh, Shandigar ultimately will probably turn out to be more like Manhattan. Uh, in the sense that the Manhattan example is much more diverse than the Chandigarh, etc. Now, here are some pictures of uh, Renaissance towns in Italy, which, again, have, uh, have introduced the fractal idea to some extent. Uh, if you're trying to defend a town like this, then you pack your archers or, um, or your army, basically, the archers uh, around the walls, basically. And what you see in this particular context is that these fortified towns, basically, these ideal fortified towns of which there are a number in uh, in Italy and uh, in Europe from the Renaissance days uh, indicate how they've added to the wall by these crenellations. So a very simple example of how fractal geometry sort of works in practice, basically. Okay, size and scaling. We've talked a lot about scaling, basically, and there are many laws about scaling. And the classic signature of scaling is the so-called power law, the only algebraic function that has the same form when its scale is actually changed, basically, in this particular context. Um, let me list a number of these things. If, for example, we look at a city and we look at the population in a city, um, the population in a city, which we might call P, generates P squared interaction. So if you're living in a village of 10 people, then there's potentially there's 10 squared interaction 
possible interactions. Okay, the the the, the interactions two ways we could sort of forget about them basically, but let let's assume that. Um, uh, we do interact with ourselves and we interact with our neighbours and our neighbours interact with us. Then you get uh, 10, 10 squared for a village of 10 would give you 100 interactions. Double it to 20 and you get 400 interactions. Double it again to 40 and you get um, uh, uh, 1,600 interactions, basically 160 interactions, I should say. Um, so in other words, as P goes up, as the size of the city goes up, the 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 sheer the, the sheer increase in interactions goes up geometrically in this sense, and that's particularly important because one of the things that we're saying is that cities get bigger, um, they get richer, they get more diverse, there are more opportunities. This is really what Jane Jacobs was saying back in her book, uh, that really cities should, uh, should 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 actually give the opportunities for extensive interaction in this particular context. And bigger cities in this sense give you more than proportionate interactions. And a whole range of theories that have emerged about uh, innovation in cities related to the size of the city and so on. Um, uh, this is true of the, uh, of the in terms of big cities, basically. The bigger the city, the more likely you are to have uh, inventions and patents and things of that in this context. Now, this is what the biologists call allometry. It's what the economists call economies of scale or agglomeration economies. It means that as things get bigger uh, in this particular context, they get more than proportionately richer in some sense. And this has been demonstrated um, uh, a number of times for different cities in terms of their scale and their wealth in this particular context. Here's a picture taken from um, Lewis Bettencourt and Jeff West Santa Fe uh, Cities Group, basically published in PNAS in 2007. Uh, you can see that here we've got, um, this is classic allometry, here we've got uh, uh, the, a scale of, um, of, of a human being from a baby, basically, uh, from six months old through to uh, 25. And you can actually see the change in shape. <clears throat> and the argument would be, that small cities have got different shapes from big cities in that sense. They evolve in terms of shape. There are lots of things that illustrate this, that you've got to probably have to reach about 4 million people before you can get a proper subway system in that sense. You don't get subway systems of towns <coughs> of um, uh, 500,000, for example. They're simply not... Uh, diverse enough with enough interactions to be able to, to take place. Now, of course, you, if we if we actually uh, regress the uh, the wages in these towns of different sizes on the population uh, and other things such as uh, patents and so on, then we get a relationship. And the point is, in this context, is that the relationship is a little bit more than a little bit more than linear, basically, in that sense that the the shape or the slope rather of that line that you can see in there where we've plotted wages against population is a little bit more than one, which is a bit like saying that um, uh, that as we increase the uh, increase the population, then the wages increase slightly more than proportionately. Uh, and th this is an important issue. In other words, the wages in places like uh, like Hong Kong, for example, Oh, let, let me let me use a British example. It's probably the, the wages in a place like Manchester, for example, would be um, a little bit less uh, than the wages in a place like London, basically, because London is, you know, two or three times as big. I mean, that's the theory of, of allometry in this context. So there are some quite important uh, implications in this sense. Um, I don't have any uh, examples of how cities change in shape. Darcy Wentworth Thompson in his... Um, book on growth and form has some wonderful pictures of how fishes change in shape due to the as they increase in size basically in that sense it'd be nice to think that we had cities we had pictures of cities in this sense but what we do have um is relationships such as this so i've taken the the primary urban areas in the uk here there's 63 of them and you can see the names of places london and birmingham here but uh, the 63 biggest cities and i plotted wages against population um, and the slope uh, is only very slightly sort of um, 
uh, more than one, basically. But for patents, for example, is it patents or business services, for example, then the slope is a, a good deal more greater than one in this particular context. We're really saying that, that a lot of um, uh, higher tech and uh, things of that sort are more likely to be increasing more than proportionately in uh, big cities than in, uh, in small cities in that sense. Now, lots of scaling laws exist, for example, the, uh, the, the, the law that says that um, the number of potential connections goes up as the square of population, in a sense, or something less than the, the, the square, but nevertheless greater than one. This is referred to um, uh, in as Metcalfe's law. It's the network equivalent of Moore's law, basically, and Gilder's law. These are uh, ideas of growth, basically, in a sense. But Metcalfe's law really relates to networks, basically, in that sense. Um, there are lots of things that relate from this average time of travel increases uh, as networks increase, that uh, as the density in central areas tends to increase in, 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 as they grow, basically. All of those things are, are contained in, in, in Metcalfe's law. West's law is really related to this notion about average real income and wealth increases. This is a pure allometry, basically. It's also Marshall's law after Marshall, who... Uh, the uh, 19th century economist, basically, who uh, introduced economies of scale, basically, in that sense. So we've got a couple of law. We've got Metcalfe's law and we've got West law in this particular context. Uh, other laws, for example, as cities get bigger, they tend to get greener. That's Brandt's law after Stuart Brandt, who is, wrote the whole Earth catalogue. Um, and as cities get bigger, there are less of them. This is the this is the rank size rule. So there are lots of laws of this kind. There's another law that really relates to density in cities. Uh, as uh, you go more or less from the center of the city to the edge, to the periphery in sense, densities tend to fall off and they fall off as a power law, basically. Uh, and this we, we can refer to as provisionally anyway, uh, as Alonzo's law after William Alonzo, basically, but it's also, uh, you know, articulated by people like Colin Clark and Alan Wilson and people of that sort, basically. So lots of laws of scaling. Now, these are not hard laws that you might expect the science to be full of hard laws, basically, in that sense. So this is not that sort of science. But in fact, even that sort of science, it's no longer that clear that uh, there are hard laws, basically, in some sense. Uh, in this, as soon as one introduces the human being or the stakeholder into the equation, basically, uh, then many of these laws really become observed regularities uh, and could at any time, at any point in time, be uh, be turned on their heads, basically, in that sense. So again, part and parcel of all of this uh, really relates to laws. OK, uh, uh, let me tell you where we are. We're, we're, we've probably got another 10 minutes or or 15 minutes to go, 10 minutes, I would think, in that sense. Let me say something about networks, because we've been looking at locations and we've also looked at networks, basically. Now, what's happened um, in our world uh, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years is that the idea of networks has become very central. Uh, the idea of the social network, for example, is, is at the root of this. But there are people like uh, Laszlo Barabasi and so on and Vespignani who've uh, developed a great deal of uh, work on networks, basically. And networks also scale. If you look at the, the nodes or the hubs in a network, then uh, big hubs basically uh, scale in a way that the, the, the number of no nodes um, or the number of links basically in, an, in a node or a hub basically uh, scale in, in, in this particular context. So we can, we can apply Zipp's law in that sense and a variety of things in this way. Here are some pictures uh, of networks, some of them modern, so, uh, some of them ancient. Uh, the network is really pretty central to this idea of the science of cities. What we've got here, for example, on the immediate, the top left, is um, a picture of a network diagram, a flow diagram in the Pale of Dublin, basically. The uh, the the uh, the little point is uh, is the capital of Ireland back in 1820 1820 uh, 1830 I think 1837, and that picture was constructed by the British Army in Ireland largely because the government in England basically wanted to work out whether or not there would be a railway. That's the sort of thing that happens even today in transportation planning. We look at the flow on the road system, basically, 
uh, and so on. So it was, it, it was even done. This was this was long before um, you know there was really any vehicular traffic to speak of. They were thinking of planning a railway, and did they need enough demand, basically, in a sense? Uh, and and most of those uh, flows basically are horses and carts and pedestrians and so on. Uh, in that sense. So in some respects, there's nothing new under the sun. There's plenty of these examples. And then we see some fractal like pictures in the middle uh, that was done um, uh, uh, by Germans. And so then we see Ravenstein's uh, diagrams in in uh, Britain in um, in terms of migration. Uh, and then on the bottom line, basically, you can see a lot of different uh, uh, different flow diagrams, basically, in that sense. So giving you an idea that uh, this stuff is not necessarily new, but pulling it together into this science is relatively new. Here again are some more real and abstract flow maps. You can see um, uh, a couple on the left there, basically. But let me just point to the uh, let me just point to the Dubai. Uh, is it Dubai? Yes, probably Dubai. The the Palm Island, basically, on the right hand side is a classic example of um, trying to force, if you like, uh, location. That's the Palm Island and the, uh, the, the, the little fields between, the, between the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the branches of the palm, basically, are where they moor their boats, basically, in a sense. So uh, again, you can compute the fractal dimensions of all these. They don't fill the whole 2D space. They fill uh, a certain amount of it. Um, and indeed, we, need, we can measure the degree of self-similarity in these things. Uh, in this way. Okay, different sorts of networks. Let me move on uh, in some senses. Okay. Now, one of the kind of features is that, uh, which I've not really mentioned, is that a good deal of what we're thinking about in terms of this science of cities, to some extent, remains invisible to us, really, that we can't really figure out the visibility of these things because they're electronic flows. And here, for example, we see uh, Facebook flows basically on the the top left, basically in that sense, showing you the flows. This has been constructed by people at Facebook in terms of who 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 links to who, uh, in this sense. But it's extremely difficult to get this kind of data, basically in that sense. Uh, and that's one of the kind of features of a good deal of um, a good deal of our thinking about cities that it is exceptionally difficult uh, to get the individual data in that sense. OK, let me actually begin to conclude and say that a lot of what I've talked about is gradually being incorporated into our computer models of city systems. And these form part of this emerging city science. Now, I can only point the way by way of conclusion. We could spend uh, uh, a lecture again talking about models of different kinds, but many models are now being built uh, at, at all scales. And we're actually in a sort of situation where um, Perhaps more than one model is being built of the same thing. Uh, you've probably heard of this uh, this hot topic called digital twins. Basically, digital twins are no no more or less than different sorts of models of the same system. Basically, but one of the kind of key features is that uh, we we're, the, in many fields we're thinking about building models uh, basically of the system uh, in that sense and uh, and, and uh, in the urban area. In the urban context, uh, this, this is really no different from, 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 from many of these things. So I'm going to illustrate uh, to you a particularly simple model that contains a good deal of um, uh, what we've talked about, basically, at least implicitly, and then show you how we're building a digital twin of Britain in that sense, of all the cities in Britain. And you'll see that uh, uh, a lot of the, the material, basically, a lot of the data, basically, is fairly similar. So this is a simple model where we start with employment uh, and we generate population. It's circular. If we look at the urban system, uh, we can divide it where people live and where they work, basically. It's a gross simplification, of course, but uh, we simply need to use these simplifications to get a handle on things. And here we see um, we have a model that actually produces... Um, it takes uh, employment and it works out where people live uh, in terms of origins to destinations. Uh, and then once we find out where people live, <clears throat> we can also build another model to find out uh, uh, where they're employed, basically. So there is circular reasoning here, but at some point we have to break into the urban system uh, at some point and 
make an assumption what influences what. Employment influences population and population influences employment. <clears throat> we can also look at flow. Those are flows of people on the left, but these are flows of um, of income on the right. Wages and, and wages basically generate uh, the wages are then used to uh, uh, to actually travel to uh, where that where people live uh, and uh, also to buy houses. Basically, in that sense, that in turn leads to additional demand for services and so on, which in turn creates employment uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, wages. In that sense, so you can see these are just different conceptions of the same sort of flow system, basically. Uh, now, we're building a model like this for Britain. So all the cities in Britain, and I'm not going to bore you with the fine details of this, except to say that we have many thousands of zones, basically, in that sense. Uh, and if we have thousands of zones, uh, think about the P squared business again. Thousands of zones lead to a thousand times squared, a thousand uh, to the power of two, basically, in terms of potential interactions or trips, basically. So we're building a model um, in this particular context, and you can see the sort of bits that we, we have three different modes based on networks. I'll show you those in a moment. Um, and by and large, what we have in this particular context um, uh, is a model that enables us to look at the impact of changes on different cities uh, to scenarios and so on to look at what if scenarios uh, and uh, the different cities will um, uh, the different uh, scenarios basically uh, really relate to the fact that the city it's very difficult to partition the cities into separate cities so if we're building um, a high-speed railway for example it's going to have an impact on many of these cities almost everywhere within the rail network in that sense so the reason why we scaled our city models to the whole country basically is largely because it's very difficult you know using the systems analogy the systems approach suggested that we define a system as being quite separate from its external environment, that's increasingly difficult to do in a global world in that sense. So that's the reason why we scale to the UK. Also, this particular model is actually a web-based model, so you can actually run it, run it on the web, basically, in that particular context. Uh, we've got several different net networks in this particular context. We've got a road network, so we have a, a, a people traveling by road in the model. Uh, we've got a bus network and we've got a rail network. Can you see how, uh, as we move from uh, left to right in this context, uh, to the rail network, which is the red one, um, the, the third in from the left, uh, then this is very sparse compared to the bus network, which in turn is a good deal sparser than the actual road network. On the immediate right, we've actually got um, an active travel network, which is based on... Um, uh, detailed movement by individuals walking and um, it doesn't mean to say that everybody walks from uh, John O'Groats to Land's End in a sense but it means that uh, uh, you have a high density of walking a high density of biking and so on so we have these different networks <clears throat> and these are all competing for travelers basically uh, in this particular context so this is uh, this is our model of Britain uh, of course what we can do in this context uh, it embodies many of these ideas that I've been talking about. What we can actually do is then use these models to look at what if scenarios. Uh, that's a picture of what the model looks like. So a lot of these computer techniques that uh, we're developing in data science and so on are used in that context. Unlike some of our earlier models a few years ago, uh, then here we've got a model which on the on the server side is largely a set of web services. They're programs, of course, in some sense. And on the client side, this is what you would see if you ran the model. Uh, you have a variety of visualization, basically. So all of this stuff basically depends, if you like, on some of the ideas that I've been talking about in terms of uh, complexity theory, etc. Uh, this model is called Quant, basically. And here's an example of how we can actually begin to use it. Uh, here we've got, this is West uh, Lancashire, uh, Liverpool and Manchester. Uh, and what we've done in this instance is simply... Uh, change the amount of population, or sorry, the amount of employment in one region, the little red dot in the center, and look at the spread, basically, in a sense. So we can develop many scenarios based on changing uh, the networks, changing the locations, and so on, in that sense. And these are just a limited number of things that are relevant to 
uh, development in this region that uh, you might think that uh, changing employment and population and, and the network are just simply some of the things we might do to build a scenario. That's absolutely right. Uh, but nevertheless, the, we need these sorts of complexity of models to actually figure things out in that particular way. Uh, and uh, the model is uh, is England, Scotland and Wales. And you can see here employment density and population counts, basically, to give you an idea of this, this sort of digital twin. So these sorts of models are being used to uh, extend, if you like, our understanding of cities. But at the same time, there are links towards planning practice, links towards how we might use them in a practical context. OK, conclusions and where do we go from here? Now, uh, we could say much more about models, but it's another story, basically, in that sense. But it's consistent with the idea of uh, uh, science in this context. Uh, and we need to disentangle the wood from the trees in terms of scaling. It's a, it's an area that is particularly important because it is uh, it replicates things at different scales uh, in cities. But we need to figure it out in a more substantive way so it's a it's part of the agenda really in that sense uh we need stronger substantive theory one of the one of the biggest single problems about the way we think about cities is that our theories are continually changing they're not very stable in themselves this may be the nature of cities that the cities are not very stable they're getting ever more complex uh, as we invent more and more technologies and because of that um it's very difficult to produce stable theory, unlike in the uh, in the physical sciences, where theory is relatively stable. Uh, in the social sciences, it isn't. It's intrinsic to us in some sense. Of course, when we nest physical science within a human domain, uh, then we have the, the same sorts of instability that we see in terms of cities. Uh, so we need better theory per se, and we also need theory that really grapples with this whole question about how simple should the theory be? Um, how do we validate it? Are we able to validate it in any sense? Uh, and it has quite strong implications for our ability to predict or not uh, in some sense. Uh, and we need a stronger sense of how bottom-up thinking can be embedded in top-down control and planning. In other words, at the end of the day, uh, we're in the business of trying to produce a better quality of life in cities, more sustainable and resilient cities in that sense. Uh, and all of that has to be kind of factored into this great morass of ideas, really, that are, that are floating around and waiting to be sort of um, organized in some sense in terms of this emerging science. OK, now I'd like to uh, uh, thank you all for listening to this, basically. Uh, remind you again that uh, if you wanted a copy of this, then the tiny URL, tinyurl.com 4BNZ55RU, uh, basically will will give it you in that sense. If anybody uh, uh, doesn't copy that down and they want it uh, later, then send me an email at m.batty at ucl.ac.uk. Uh, and I just want to say these are the books I've referred to, some of them. Um, Professor Chen referred to the Urban Informatics book, which is very much a, a PolyU book uh, edited by uh, John Shen, uh, myself, Mike Goodchild, uh, Maypo Kwan and Anshu Zhang, basically, which is open access. We're very proud of that book because um, uh, it's had like a million downloads or something incredible, basically. Only the net can actually show that. Uh, and then a couple of the books that uh, I show there are actually translated into Chinese. So the invented uh, future cities and the new science of cities that are Chinese versions out there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, our host, Professor Chen and uh, his team in pair. Uh, and I think we're going to move into questions, are we, at this particular point? Now I'm going to stop sharing and uh, you can... Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor Betty, for a very uh, inspiring and clear uh, lecture. And I think you present a very important information. Uh, as uh, the you know, the entire global is uh, moving to the urbanization. The cities uh, becomes uh, more important than ever. Now uh, we'll enter the Q and A sessions. Uh, audience, you might type your questions in the Q and A. You can see in the bottom of your screen, and then I will invite uh, Professor John Si 
who is uh, the Otto Poon Charity Foundation Research Institute for Smart Cities here at the Polytechnic University to help me uh, managing this uh, Q&A session. So, um, John, so maybe you wanted to yes. start the, uh, ask the first question and then <laughs> you can uh, reply. Okay, so here we have a quite a number of uh, uh, questions in the six or something uh, uh, for the presentation. The first one is uh, um, uh, the urban informatics. You can hear the noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the uh, major features in urban informatics is to collect, use, and apply big data to better inform city planning. Uh, big data in terms of a general trend on the movement of uh, cars, individuals, etc. But they tell little about the passengers or the pedestrians' experience. Uh, that highlights the strengths of, uh, and weakness of uh, uh, quantitative and uh, qualitative approaches. How can this issue be addressed, <laughs> Professor Paddy? Right, okay. So okay. quite a tough question in some senses. <laughs> It relates to the fact that, and I didn't really mention this in any detail, it relates to the fact that we can build our theories about um, how people move, where they locate and so on, at, at different levels of aggregation, basically. Uh, and as we move down from, uh, as you say, the general trend of the movement of cars and so on, towards individuals and towards their experiences, we get these changes taking place. So as we change scale, and to some extent, your question is a little bit about uh, changing scale, uh, we get changes in uh, different aspects of the system. What you're saying as well here is that as we uh, move towards, uh, as we change the focus, really change the lens on how people move and so on, we change the kind of things that we might be interested in 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 addressing in a sense so from quantitative ideas about movement of people in cars in cities all the way down to the quality of the experience basically in some senses how can the issue be addressed well uh i think if we knew the answer to it we'd be able to address it right basically and i agree with you uh, that it's a it's a major issue. The whole kind of quantitative, qualitative issue is very significant and always has been in uh, in terms of uh, cities. Um, many people would argue that um, any kind of science, certainly the sort of science I've been talking about, uh, really tends to ignore uh, qualitative issues in that sense. I'm not convinced it does ignore them in this sense. Uh, it doesn't explain them in some senses because I think that uh, qualitative issues pertaining to how we how how we feel about cities in some sense, uh, how we react to very complex problems that can't be broken down in that sense. Uh, some of these sorts of issues are are in some senses irresolvable. They're really part and parcel of the uh, of the context in which we're working in that sense. Okay, that probably is enough that I've said on that. John, do you want to? Yes. Drop out? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Daddy. Uh, Pro Professor Chen, you were. Yes. I, I'm going to uh, ask you the second question. You know, you would uh, make a very elegant uh, presentation and an analysis on the city form, and you use uh, like London, the New York, Dublin as an example, which uh, seems naturally evolved. Right, but now of course uh, we also have uh, some other uh, type of uh, cities. Uh, for example, the Brasilia, uh, um, Brazil capital, uh, Brasilia, has been criticized for its uh, anti-Semitic living blocks, uh, for its reliance on the highways that uh, really dissociate the people from the workable street and neighborhood and for creating uh, monumental public spaces that serve only as the iconic symbols for the tourists, et cetera, but not really a livable city. But if you look at the city of Shenzhen, our neighborhood, and then you see uh, it's been a very different type of uh, evolvement. 
and now the climate change, etc. I and mean, today we supposed to meet you in person. You are here in Poliu and you, but now we have a typhoon. All this, you know, make this uh, city development uh, a lot of more complex. I don't know if you have any comments on this type of evolution. Well, I think I, I, if we turn to the example of Brasilia, um, one of the kind of key issues is that um, this Brasilia, I think, represents a classic example of um, uh, the way we thought about cities in the middle of the 20th century. It was originally planned uh, in the 1950s in, in that sense. And it was very much top down. It took an idea about an ideal sort of a set of locations. In fact, I believe that um, uh, the original plan for the sort of core of Brasilia was based on uh, a kind of aircraft, two aircraft wings uh, related at, at a very aggregate level. Uh, and the plan was, like many new town plans, top down, was conceived really without thinking about how people would behave. In other words, um, uh, the plan basically broke all the rules or all the ideas that Jane Jacobs had in a in a famous book, um, uh, and in in some senses, what has happened in Brasilia is that the town has has, has slowly evolved, or maybe rapidly evolved towards um, what would a, a, an organically growing bottom up city actually look like basically in that sense and so many of the problems uh, that uh, have, have, uh, pertain to Brasilia uh, really relate to the fact that the, uh, the the development was out of joint really with the way people behave and what they needed and things of that sort now that was the first point I mean if we generalize that to cities in general uh, and I'm thinking here I don't I probably don't know enough about these places to be to be to, to be authoritative about it. Uh, in some sense, but in terms of Shenzhen, um, yeah, would you say would one say that Shenzhen was a sort of a bottom-up type type city? To some extent, yes, um, and I think that's due to the fact that at the beginning of the development of Shenzhen, I don't think the the idea of um, uh, an airport there or lots of different city centres and so on was really on the cards. I'm not sure there was a plan of that particular context. So a lot of it was uh, was based on, uh, you know, what was happening and the, the, the growth of uh, population um, in Chinese cities, the movement uh, uh, from, the, from the countryside to the city and so on. Um, again, what we're talking about here is, um, uh, is, is the idea of, um, you know, planning, if you like, versus uh, top-down planning versus kind of, you know, bottom-up um, reactions, by the population in some sense. Uh, that would be my immediate response. There's a lot, I think there's a lot of uh, issues contained in your question. In fact, all these questions contain many issues rather than the, the particular one in that sense. And that again, reflects, I think, the complexity of what we're talking about when it comes to cities. That's a great answer, you know. Uh, even we look at the sustainability, uh, that's a question uh, related. They say like uh, linear cities like um, uh, Saudi Arabia, yeah. do you think it's that is sustainable or not? Well, I mean, the Saudi Arabian example, the NEOM, the 170-mile uh, yeah. um, linear city that's planned by the crown prince, basically, um, is an, a very extreme example of top-down planning and also top-down planning that really isn't worked out. A lot of things have not been worked out. Um, it's almost a publicity exercise to work it out, basically, in a sense. Um, a lot of the working out is being developed on the fly in that sense. The idea of a 170-mile city with 9 million, 170-kilometer uh, linear city um, in a region of Saudi Arabia, which is, you know, pretty hostile, I think, well, much of Saudi Arabia is in terms of its climate and uh, uh, and, uh, and and configurations and so on. Um, basically, it's hard to know why you would want um, uh, a city organized in that particular fashion, because a linear city um, does not have the advantages of a... Uh, 
circular city in the sense that if you think about where people are, are related, um, in a in a in a if everybody is randomly scattered in a circular city, basically, then there's a lot more opportunity for interaction than in the case of a linear city, basically, in that sense. Um, and then if you actually begin to think about the linear city and how transportation figures, I've never figured out in neon they'd have to start building it at one end or the other. But let's assume that you have a, a high-speed train uh, running between you know, one, one end and the other end, basically. Uh, the frequency of stations to get the sort of, um, to get the stops in would be quite problematic, basically. So the whole notion of why you would have a train running, you know, 170 kilometers from north to south, basically, um, uh, or east to west or whatever it is, is quite problematic. Um, so I think that many of these, many, of course, having said all of that, um, most cities have got conscious planning, right? We can't ignore it. So my notion that the world switches from top down to bottom up is not quite right in some sense, because the reality is, of course, that we have both, right? There's a lot of bottom up activity taking place in cities, which is generating more organically sort of uh, looking kind of forms, et cetera. And there's also a reasonable amount of top down and in different cities around the world. I think probably here in in, uh, in Hong Kong, you have probably st st uh, stricter, to some extent, stricter controls because of the nature of the terrain in some senses. Um, uh, the nature of the train and the nature of the environment. It's a little bit more hostile than you might find in, the, say, the UK in that context. So, so, so planning control needs to be exercised in some sense, more importantly in some senses. So it's a mixture of, of, of top-down, bottom-up in a sense. Okay, thank you. John? Yes, another question is on the fractal theory. Uh, the question is, is the analysis of a fractal mainly to study the similarity of some attribute of a city in different scales and uh, are the situation of the scales uh, determines the uh, dimensions of the fractal. Uh, so, say, say, can you can you repeat that again, John? I sort of missed a little bit of it. Oh, yeah. So that question is about about a fractal theory. So yeah. the question is, is the analysis of a fractals mainly to study similarity of some attribute of the city in different scales? Well, uh, to, to some extent, um, uh, a fractal is um, probably the best way of approaching that question is to say that uh, a fractal um, embodies a process, a process of development uh, that actually does not really change as you move scale. So in other words, you grow a little bit of the fractal and it gets bigger uh, and you keep adding uh, modules to it, it gets bigger. And as it gets bigger, it has the same shape in some sense as the original module, basically in that sense. So um, I mean, that this is an observation about, uh, about growth. I mean, a classic example is a tree. So you start off with, you know, a stem and you know, you've got a couple of twigs, basically, and then the twigs turn into uh, you know, the bifurcation basically takes place. Um, and, and the tree reaches out uh, to the atmosphere and grows. I mean, it's a classic example of a fractal uh, in that sense. So the very notion of growing the tree to actually maximize its energy, basically, to optimize its energy, um, is a, is a, it leads to leads to a fractal in that particular context. Okay. Now the question is that what we what we see uh, to to an extent in cities, it's always to an extent, um, is that as cities grow, they they have the same thing. Now whether or not um, uh, one would want to change that in any way, uh, I don't think has ever really been looked at. In other words. If a city grows as a fractal, and you could think of it as an ideal city growing in, in a certain little module, basically being repeated over and over again, and the city getting bigger, and the module uh, basically looking like the, the big sort of city looking like the little module, basically, just like a tree in that sense, um, 
the question then is is this an efficient process we must ask those questions because we we, we want to live in more sustainable cities uh, and more resilient cities in that sense and i'm not sure there's been very much work done at all on 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 relating that sort of growth process to uh, to individual cities to in and individual planning in that sense uh, so the answer is it's um the, the, i think the response to the question is that um it's it's very unclear and it needs more work it needs more work on empirical examples one of the last things i didn't quite say right at the end of the talk was that we need many more applications i mean one of the big problems in our field i think is that the applications are difficult the uh, the, 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 they depend on data that often we don't have and so on uh, in this particular context. So, so, so in some senses, we need many, many more applications before we can address some of these questions, basically. Yeah, thank you, Professor Vanti. Yeah, Professor Chen. Yeah, that's a question on the, uh, how could the interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary method uh, help to elaborate a more stable and in-depth theoretical background of uh, our informatic models. For example, could uh, anthropological field work be useful for urban science? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think a lot of the data that we require can only be um, can only be produced by a much more hands-on traditional way of actually collecting data. Um, uh, one of the difficulties, I think, is that we need a lot of data to make sense of things. Uh, I mean, cities are complex in this sense. Uh, we need a lot of data to make, uh, uh, to get to grips with their understanding in that sense. Um, uh, and this probably can't be uh, collected by uh, automatic means. So uh, we obviously face a situation at the present, well, we've evolved a situation at the present time where a lot of new data is available through real-time sensing. Um, the many aspects of data that we need to think about cities and the way I've talked about uh, really are not likely to be produced by those sort of automated sensing systems. A lot of good data can be produced that way, but a lot can't. And we need to rely on traditional methods of questionnaire, which tend to be very expensive. The reason why we do um, a 10-year census is basically because of the sheer expense of doing it. Now, that's getting cheaper to some extent. And there are systems around where um, uh, uh, in uh, sample data, where, 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 where data is being collected and automated uh, for uh, what traditionally were uh, uh, questionnaire-based surveys and so on. So, yeah, I think that uh, the anthropological point of view is a little bit more, uh, I, I think it's probably more related to the fact that um, the scale tends to be a bit smaller uh, in terms of the, uh, the anthropologies that are being investigated and so on. Um, uh, in that particular context, uh, it's it, many of the things I talked about require much bigger scale data to actually get. But I don't, I think that if one's talking about, and we could have talked about the idea of complexity at a very small scale within the neighborhood, for example, once we get down to that level, then I think we can, we can use traditional techniques and well-grounded techniques in ethnography and so on uh, to be able to make sense of what's going on, really. So I don't see any basic conflict between um, uh, the development of anthropological tools, basically, for, for observing data and figuring out how things work uh, and what I was really saying, in a sense. I think we have to also be aware of the fact at what scale and what level and what focus we've actually got. I mean... Uh, I'm not saying that a, a lot of the things that I talked about can't be used to do certain things that we might want them to use in that sense. So there are limits, really, in some sense, to uh, to to any approach. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pro Professor Betty. And yeah. Uh, yes. Another question is uh, about uh, AI. Where is? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just uh, lost. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Sorry, John. Another question is about AI. Yes, artificial intelligence. I I, I I'm looking for this question. It's right. Just, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, I can read a little for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Essentially, AI systems are set to change the city planning method. Regarding the gathered information processing and predicting urban development urban development models, could this change the top-down, bottom-up thinking in the near future? Which technologies would like to disrupt the science of the cities? You're going to have to repeat that again to me, uh, Professor Chen. Yeah, I mean, the now AI, right? You wanted to yeah. use AI to change the city planning and then uh, to get uh, the uh, information, process the information and predict how this uh, urban development will be. Now, all this change to the traditional method is just top down and bottom up, you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So how the all this have the impact on your science of a city? <laughs> okay, so um, well, I think there are many aspects of AI that relate to what I was saying. Uh, clearly, um, in a routine sense, um, AI, I think, or the many aspects of AI which we we use already, basically, to uh, you know produce and organize data. Um, in this particular context. And it's not just data. I mean, it's not just, um, you know, data science. It's actually the kind of data that is produced in some senses. Uh, so we're already, we, we, it's a synonym really for um, contemporary computing in many senses in this context. So, you know, I showed towards the end um, a picture of, um, you know, our web services and, you um, uh, our models and so on in that sense. There's bits and pieces of AI that float in and out of that, really, in some sense. The bigger question about um, top-down versus bottom-up um, and in terms of AI, uh, then in some respects, um, uh, that mirrors the history of AI. The, the idea of the top-down AI was really the one that dominated until the mid-1970s when... I, when um, uh, when computers were first invented, um, there was this notion that they could be used to um, to simulate, you know, human decision making in some sense, i.e., human intelligence, basically. Um, and there was, you know, very brave attempts to do things about that, but they came to very little. Um, and uh, in the in the in the mid seventies, a lot of the funding was withdrawn. So this so called AI went to, into its nuclear winter. Now this was. The top-down sort of AI was very much strong AI, you know, uh, the whole planning process of how individuals thought about uh, making decisions and so on was really part and parcel of that. What's emerged since then is uh, largely, I think, due to big data and computation, is a kind of weak AI. And what we're talking about when we're talking about machine learning and so on is relatively weak AI. Uh, it's producing systems that are explicable in some sense, but not necessarily explicable in the sense that they mirror human thought, really, in that sense. Uh, now, of course, how does that relate to um, what I was talking about? To some extent, I think we've moved to uh, much more a, a bottom-up way of thinking about how things get constructed. And this has moved away from, you could almost say that, that the theory about how the world works is very top-down in some sense. That in, in terms of any kind of context of, of developing theory rather than bottom up. Uh, and so in a way, AI actually mirrors that in a sense. But I'm very much of the view that AI is a, is a, a kind of generic uh, focus that we've always been talking about in terms of making sense of cities uh, in that sense then. Um, and we're making sense cities, well, I, I'd, I'd hesitate to go on as far as to say that cities were artificial in any sense. I wouldn't use that sort of language, basically. Um, but what I am saying is that uh, a good deal of what goes on in AI, I think, is is how we begin to think about putting data together to you know, make sense of cities in that context. Not a very satisfactory answer, but it's a big question in the sense that we're simply getting to grips with this. 
uh, with AI and beginning to use it in a very generic sense, I think. Thank you very much, Professor Betty. John, you might continue. Yes. Uh, uh, John, again, <laughs> let me see. Yes. Um, the science, the new science of cities is complex and interdisciplinary. It involves a theory, models, and uh, ideas uh, from uh, multiple fields. As educator of university administrator, uh, what would be the kind of uh, learning exposure experience needed for creating successful programs in urban informatics or smart city development? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, um, uh, and it, it, it gets to the heart of interdisciplinarity in this particular context. Um, I tend to think that um, no program can be truly interdisciplinary in that sense, but that we need to make effort to identify the different disciplines that pertain to uh, certain applications. So in some senses, we need to know what uh, our education will lead to. So in other words, we need to know uh, the sort of tasks that uh, a product of the educational system in urban informatics, for example, might might relate to uh, in that sense. And, and there's some very big um, uh, differences there. So, for example, if you look in the uh, uh, in, in in the book, there's about in the book that I, I mentioned, there's about 45 chapters, something like that, dealing with a very wide range of issues. And even in that book, there are lots of things that we might consider to be part of urban informatics that are not in the book, basically. Um, uh, and in, in that context, it says it all, really, that it's not possible for a program to deal with all of these things. But what it is possible to do, I think, and we do this to some extent anyway, is to develop programs where the heartland of the program is related to the expertise that we uh, uh, identify as being important for a particular set of tasks in that sense um, and we and and really the the it ought to, in teaching the context of that the context would pull in many of these other disciplines basically so a good example would be um, uh, the extent to which uh, urban af urban informatics was largely concerned with developing tools in data science um, versus the fact that um, urban informatics might be used to uh, develop um, a whole set of uh, different sorts of models that pertain to uh, economic development and things of that sort. So I think that um, traditionally, um, the things that comprise this wide array of stuff that we uh, relate to in terms of cities, we have to kind of basically define uh, what's relevant at that level uh, and then see how all the other disciplines that are you know beginning to impinge on it uh, relate now that's extremely problematic if you look at planning education for example that's urban planning education what's happened over the years and it's entirely understandable is that the curricula has continued to change and has no stability whatsoever um uh, and um, in many senses, much of the, the material I was talking about is simply not talk, taught to town planners any longer. Um, uh, and it's not really surprising that, uh, that many of the tools are not actually used. And that doesn't go just for what I've been talking about, you know, in terms of, um, you know, complex systems and so on and models, etc. There are lots of areas of, um, uh, uh, lots of areas of uh, which are relevant to uh, cities that are not taught uh, in various planning programs. Economics is a good example, um, urban economics in particular. Um, so so I, I think that, um, uh, that that one has to kind of be very closely define what's needed in terms of an urban informatics program. Uh, and it will vary. Urban informatics for um, people involved in transportation uh, issues and so on or involved in uh, in housing etc is going to be very different from urban informatics for 
uh, people are uh, talking about uh, smart city issues. I should say something about the smart city. As I was scanning through the um, the questions, somebody talked a little bit about smart cities. I didn't really make the point that there's another dimension to uh, the whole question of um, the smart city versus other views about cities, and that is that um, we can. I tend to think of the smart city as being what I call the high frequency city. It's what's happening over the next 24 hours. Uh, the low frequency city is what's happening over the next 20 years in that sense. And they're very different. They're very different animals in some sense that uh, uh, the concerns are different. Uh, the things that we're trying to optimize in the short term are very different from the long term and so on. And the theories are different. We tend to be uh, in terms of the low frequency city, talking about much more aggregate kind of issues uh, in that sense. Um, uh, and um, urban informatics, in a sense, cuts across across both of those things, really, in, in some senses. Uh, so the smart city is largely the high frequency city, in my view. And it's something that has come onto the agenda um, in the last um, uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, and it coincides with big data and a whole range of things of that sort. Uh, and it's it's also a verge because it's now possible to think of cities. It's not that people never did anything about the short term or the 24-hour city in the past. It's just they didn't do it using um, uh, computing and urban informatics in that context. Or if they did, it was a sort of rather narrow version of it in that sense. So, so we have these two dimensions, the short and the long term, I suppose we could call them as well. Uh, and urban informatics varies dependent upon uh, that particular focus. Uh, I mean, many people who talk, whenever you talk about cities, they they tend to think of the short term city, you know, it's the next, you know, five minutes or the next five hours rather than the next 50 years or some, something like that. Um, uh, so, again, that has to be factored in. OK, well, thank you so much, Professor Betty, for your uh, concluding remarks. You really have done a great job today in answering all those questions. You know, we are already overrunning uh, this lecture <laughs> considerably. So I think uh, we still have uh, too many questions so we probably cannot ask you to answer. So, but anyway, we'll forward the questions to you. You might want to <laughs> yeah. uh, reply later by um, email and we will post on our website. Sure. And uh, today, unfortunately, we have this telephone solar uh, just uh, uh, in the city, so we couldn't really hold this uh, on site, but we really, uh, I'm really pleased to see so many people show up online yeah, during this better weather period. And I would like to thank all the audience and also for their questions posed on the internet. And finally, I also wanted to thank the professors for helping me in managing those questions. And of course, we wish uh, Professor Betty, who will return back to London, supposed to be tomorrow. But I think uh, the typhoon wanted to uh, retain you for one more day. And we wish you have a very nice uh, journey back at home. Thank you again. Uh, and this concludes uh, the today's lecture. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor right. Betty, Professor Yan, and all.